please welcome to the stage Takasha Basu, Mary Robinson, Zalika Mandela, and Carrie Kennedy in conversation with Jessica Cohen. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you everybody for spending this beautiful day with us. Um, pretty sure the four of you don't need much introduction. And I think between the four of you, having devoted your careers to such a wide range of advocacy issues, we've got all the global goals covered right here. <laughs> um, that said, if you could take a minute and tell the audience just a little something about yourself, and then what I'm curious is, you've done such a wide range of work here and worked on so many different issues. When was your aha moment in human rights when you realized environmental rights were a human right? All right, I guess uh, I should start? Sure. OK, no pressure. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I am Zolega Mandela, and um, I am a mother of five. Um, I have a 22-year-old daughter um, who would have been 22 this year that was killed by a drunk driver in 2010. Um, and that's very quickly um, you know, led to my road safety um, activism. Um, I am the ambassador, global ambassador for the Child Health Initiative, and what we do is uh, we advocate for the needs um, and the rights of children, um, uh, and we also highlight, um, you know, the impact of unsafe roads as well as toxic air. And what we do is focus on ensuring that um, children have safe and healthy journeys to school, no matter where they live um, in this world. Um, our focus is also um, here in New York um, is to uh, really launch a call for a summit that focuses on um, the issues that adolescents um, are faced with. Um, like I said, I am a mother of five and you know, I do have a 16 year old son, so not only does that um, impact me directly, but I'm a mother and an African child who understands the issues that continue to plague um, our adolescents, being someone that has survived um, mental health, um, you know, I, I am a survivor of depression and suicidal behavior and self-harm. I am a survivor of sexual and physical abuse and I am a survivor of uh, breast cancer. Um, and someone that understands, um, you know, that the plight of our children can no longer be ignored. Um, shortly after my, my daughter passed away in 2010, um, my grandfather, uh, the late Nelson Kholisatla Mandela, um, asked me to sit on his lap um, and one of the things that he said to me was that um, I was not the only one to have ever lost a child and that he himself had lost a child and that many other women had lost their children and that you know for me it's, it's so that I could bring hope to many others so to answer your question I think that was my aha moment um, and, and I guess um, a very big part of it is um, you know, the words that he imparted to me are a driving force behind the work that I do. Um, and really that is wanting to speak um, hope to the hopeless and, and, and ensure that I, you know, um, enhance the voices of those who are forgotten and vulnerable. I came quite late to my aha moment yeah. of linking human rights yes. and environment and climate. Uh, I never said anything about it in my seven years as President of Ireland. Really? Never said anything about it in my five years as High Commissioner for Human Rights. I was very concerned about human rights, gender equality, rights of people with disabilities, rights of indigenous peoples. That was a big portfolio. Mm -hmm. Another part of the UN was dealing with climate. Right. And I was in my silo, as can happen. Right. And it was afterwards when I decided to have a small organization um, working on the rights that really matter if you don't have them, rights to food and safe water, health, education, shelter. And we were focusing on working as a small NGO in African countries, pioneering how an NGO would work on economic and social rights. And it was very instructive in all sorts of ways, but what really struck me was how women would say to me in particular and communities, things are so much worse. And it was the unpredictability of the weather, the, no, the rainy seasons weren't coming when they should, long periods of drought, flash flooding, destroying the village. How is this happening? I mean, Constance O'Kellett, whom I got to know, said to me, we thought God was punishing us. And then she learned more about climate change and she learned it was the lives of rich people. Interesting, the yeah. way she put it. Yeah. Um, and I realized that I had missed this huge connection 
between the way that um, the ex exacerbation, because that's what climate does, it exacerbates the drought, it, ex it makes it much worse, it makes the rainy seasons much more erratic, they, and when you have your agriculture um, you know, rain-based and uh, you're dependent on it for food security, the devastation, and of course, the impacts on gender, on women and on girls. Right. And then I read up the science and I said, oh, and went on from there and had my foundation on climate justice. Do you know what I'm thrilled about? Climate justice has become so mainstream. When I started, it wasn't. Um, you know, it's really wonderful. Um, you know, wow. <laughs> All those girls. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg and the millions who came out on, you know, striking for climate justice because of the injustice of the intergenerational, right. the intergenerational injustice. That has brought it home to every family and all of us. And I'm so grateful for those children and young people that they have brought a momentum into this Climate Action Summit, and it's badly needed. I think the mainstream moment is due in no small part to <laughs> leaders such as yourself using your voices. Uh, Kakashan, your aha moment. All right, hello everyone. My name is Kaksha. I'm 19 years old. I am a United Nations human rights champion, uh, the winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize. The youngest, oh. thank you. <laughs> I am also the youngest recipient of Canada's top 25 women of influence, and most importantly, the founder president of my own youth organization, a social innovation enterprise called Green Hope Foundation. And my green journey started when I was eight years old, when I planted my first tree on my eighth birthday. And the reason for this was when I was seven, I saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic. And I just couldn't stop thinking about the bird's agony as it must have felt as it choked to death. And it was also around that time that I attended a lecture by environmentalist Robert Swan. And his words, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it, really resonated with me. And I decided that I was going to start doing something on my own for the planet. And I started very simply by going to uh, the restaurants, the beauty saloons uh, in my neighborhood, asking them to think about the planet, to recycle, to avoid plastic usage. And on my journey, I realized that the children I was interacting uh, with, the children were more enthusiastic uh, to thinking about the environment than the adults that I interacted with. Um, and when I finally started Green Hope Foundation, it was, when I was 12 years old, it was to provide uh, other children and youth with the platform to learn about sustainability challenges and then how to take actions to mitigate these problems and how to convert uh, that passion into ground level community work that would make a positive difference. And our work is focused primarily uh, on children in marginalized communities, especially girls. So that includes in refugee camps in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, in the Sundarbans, which is the world's largest mangrove forest. And these are communities, uh, many of them, which have been directly impacted by climate change induced disasters. Uh, for example, in the Sundarbans, the mangrove forest, where Cyclone Isla literally sw just swiped uh, away entire villages that were left exposed due to mangrove deforestation. And these children that I work with are now left homeless because of a climate change induced disaster and because of deforestation. And society does not see them as the mainstream. And they're the ones who are left behind. And the SDGs talk about leaving no one behind. That's their main aim. But these are children who are left behind. And my main mission has been from the very beginning to make sure that no one, especially the children and the girls, no one is left behind. Mm, very good. Yeah. And Carrie, what was your big moment? So I think um, this is something that's always been with me and with her family. My family, I grew up in a family that was very supportive of Cesar Chavez and the farm workers in California. And um, then when I became involved in human rights around the world, I kept noticing that, um, that even though we, in the United States we thought of human rights in one area and environmentalism in another, 
that environmentalists in other countries were being imprisoned and tortured and threatened with death because of their advocacy. And um, I remember in 1986, Cesar Chavez did a big campaign for farm workers around pesticide use. The biggest cancer cluster in the United States is in Delano, California, which is the home of the United Farm Workers. And um, that's when it really hit me that this is one in the same issue. In New York, um, up until this summer, farm workers had no right to a day off per week, had no right to overtime pay, had no right to workers' comp, and could be fired for forming a union. And that, um, that one of the farm workers we talked to, I talked to, said that he worked for 10 years without a single day off in New York State. Mm. And that was legal up until July of this year. Mm. So um, we passed a law, uh, which was, you know, it took about 20 years, but we passed it this summer. And it was a real victory, but um, I saw that climate, and it's, it's not just um, environmentalism, it's, it's the combination of climate, activism, poverty, and racism. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see again and again and again all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Something that, something that struck me just listening to all four of you now was that your moments really kind of stemmed from seeing a voice that wasn't being heard and elevating voices that needed to be heard. Uh, Mary, you have said before that uh, women often bear the burden mm -hmm. of climate change. Mm -hmm. And Kekachan, your Green Hope Foundation, I know specifically focuses some of its efforts on outreach to young women. So I was hoping you guys could talk a bit about how women specifically are you know, taking the brunt of this and how we can uplift those voices that are often not heard. Well, first of all, I think we have to say that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and actually, I just want to explain, for those of you who didn't clap, that, <laughs> <laughs> that man-made is generic. We're all responsible. And a feminist solution definitely includes all the men and young men in the audience. Definitely. So, uh, uh, before I hand over to this extraordinary young woman, and they're all, all of you are extraordinary, but, um, you know, I was very frustrated until about two years ago coming in Europe or in the United States to a women's conference or a women's meeting. Because we would talk about all kinds of things, Me Too, equal pay, violence against women, and then health, then education, and then maybe reference climate but not know how to talk about it. That's literally, that has changed completely since the scientific report last October on the 1.5 degrees that we have to stay at and we have to reduce carbon emissions by 45%. The scientists said you have 12 years. Now we're in the 11th year and we're in late September. So that suddenly woke women up in a very big way. But obviously, you were awake long before that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it is, it's very, very heartening to see you young, young women, young men, children coming out in millions and, and demanding, you know, calling us out, and rightly so. But it's also very, very encouraging that women have taken this on, taken a leadership ownership of this issue, and they will problem solve us to the future, and that's what we need. Agree. Yeah. I think whenever any kind of disaster strikes, it's the people uh, in developing nations who are affected the most, within that, the people in the vulnerable communities, people living below the poverty line, and amongst them, it's the women and girls who are impacted the most. And when climate change induced disasters strike, it's the women and girls who have to bear the burden. And in our projects in the run of Kutch, which are the salt pans of India and Western India, and that produces most of the country's salt, it's the girls who have to walk the most to fetch water because mm. if you see the landscape there, it's literally like you're on Mars. Mm. There is no water to be found anywhere. And it's the girls who have to bear the burden of 
finding the water. And it's the same story in uh, Kisumu in Kenya, where we went and we saw how far the girls had to walk to fetch water. And because of climate change, every year they had to walk farther and farther. And a lot of the times, uh, people don't realize that it, climate change and gender equality, they are very much related, and you can't have one without the other. Um, and what, through our workshops at Green Home Foundation, we speak to the women and girls, we speak to everyone really about their rights, how it is their fundamental right to a clean, healthy environment, and how, especially the young girls, how they can become leaders in their communities and bring about positive change. And I'm giving the example of the Sundarbans again, when we were conducting a workshop there and we were talking about the SDGs and they had never heard of that, obviously, because they have so many other problems that they have to deal with. But through music and art and dance, when we were speaking uh, to them, one 16-year-old girl stood up and said that for me, gender equality means not getting married before the age of 18. And I found that to be so empowering because they know that they have they want these things, but many of them do not have a platform to express their views. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking about how they can become leaders and uh, leading environmental movements really helps them to come out, demand their rights, and become the true leaders that they were meant to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The phrase you used was fundamental rights human rights, and human rights are unfortunately in some countries subjective. They're not easy to litigate. And you know, it's not exactly new, however, that human rights were connected to the environment. And I was hoping, Carrie, you could explain some background on just how far back, I believe the Magna Carta is the moment when human rights and environmental rights were first linked. So, um, well, the law of Hammurabi, which was 2100 BC um, in, in, uh, in the Middle East is where this really started, but it came into our um, legal system through the Magna Carta. And who here remembers the Magna Carta? Yeah, very good, <laughs> a few of you. So um, this was 1215 and uh, King, um, King Richard, went off to, to war and left his brother John in charge of the kingdom, and, and John was very sadistic and very greedy. And, um, and then he also had to fund the Crusades, which Richard was on, and so he kept raising all the taxes, and that's when the legend of Robin Hood came up, because uh, Robin Hood was you know, taking from the rich and giving to the poor. But it, it became so oppressive that the noblemen started putting up uh, fences around the rivers and um, stopping access to the streams for fresh water and for fish and to the forests and to the oceans. And so the peasants um, came together and fought the king's men at the Battle of Runnymede. Do you remember that, the Battle of Runnymede? Yeah, and the, and the peasants won, and which this was unprecedented. And then they forced King John to sign the Magna Carta. And basically what that document says is that there are some rights that are so fundamental to every human being's existence that the king cannot own them and no one owns them. You can only protect them from one generation to the next. And so you can't sell those rights. And those are access to the water, access to the fish, access to the deer of the forest, wild animals, and access to the oceans. And that is why today, if you take a boat onto any beach in the entire United States, you can go up to the high water mark. That's because of the Magna Carta, because we have rights to access to the oceans. And also, if you take the train from here to Albany, that train runs right along the Hudson River. But every 10 miles, the state um, has a, a walkway underneath the train so that you can get to the Hudson River. And that's because of the Magna Carta. But that's the basis of uh, human rights and environmental law today. But if I can just very briefly. No, please. Um, you know, I'm very aware that when we had the um, Rio conference on the environment, 
1992. There was no reference to human rights. A year after that, we had the UN Conference on Human Rights, World Conference on Human Rights, no reference to the environment. It was actually Beijing, women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights, yes. that kind of broke that a bit. And then we started, but you know, the silos have been there. And what is wonderful now is this idea of climate justice, the injustice of climate change. It is racial, in, racial injustice. It is gender injustice. It is poverty injustice. It kind of, it, it, the justice is the unifying concept in addressing all the issues and the systemic issues that we have. We have to change so much. And that's why it's great that we have the energy of young people to help us to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I just, yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and I think you know um, the best thing um, is for the youth to be at the forefront of any crisis response, and, and in particular this uh, this agenda. I mean, they're faced with so many things, and I think, um, for example, in my country or in my region, Africa, I think the the mere fact that we have a rising number of deaths of of, of people continuously dying on our roads uh, and becoming victims of um, road traffic injury, I think just speaks to the fact that um, you know, our international community um, and as well as governments don't put people first. Um, and I think it's, it's such a tragic thing to, 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 to think about the fact that here we have our children who are the most vulnerable, um, who have a voice, um, and who have literally told our leaders that these are the solutions in order for us to have you know, safe and healthy journeys. There's no reason why any child should have to be fighting road traffic, um, ha having to face road traffic injury as they travel to school every day. There's no reason why any child should have to be even thinking of breathing in toxic air and things like that, you know, that then lead to um, other complications like NCDs. And I think really, um, I I'd wonder what our leaders are telling their own children and what they're saying about their children's future. And I think it's high time that our leaders stop paying lip service and actually, you know, protect our children because not only, um, you know, is securing um, you know, the, the, the health of the environment you know, um, a win-win situation for all. If we can just get our leaders to actually make our cities more um, child-friendly and more walkable, I think it's a win-win situation in the sense that you know, it's not just us who uh, benefit from it, but the environment. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Talking about our leaders and putting truth to power, um, I want to briefly touch on the elders, which your grandfather founded, and Mary, which you are the chair, right? Mm -hmm. And the elders very much are about taking the biggest leadership in the world, correct? And putting forth the most important issues, including climate. Yeah. And climate is not, it's climate change where no one nation is mm -hmm. gonna solve it, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah, obvious thing is obvious. But I would just hope you could talk about um, what the elders are doing to bring all nations together mm -hmm. towards this common goal. We have three overarching preoccupations, if you like. One is the kind of fragility at the moment of the multilateral system. We actually need that multilateral system to solve all these problems that we're talking about. And the um, 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement are really good examples of the good multilateralism that we need, leaving no one behind. The other two things we're very concerned about are what we call the two existential threats. One of them is climate change, that you know, we have 12 years to really get on course for a zero carbon by 2050. And if we, if we don't do that, we, we sacrifice the future of our children and grandchildren. It's an awful thing for, you know, even to think about. And the other one is the nuclear threat. The nuclear threat has become very serious. But what the elders love to do, and we always love to do it, and I loved being here, is <laughs> we love the intergenerational conversation mm. because we have a lot to learn from young people. The perspective of young people is, you know, it's a very engaged, it's very savvy, it's very digitally savvy, um, you know, when I've got problems, I ask my grandchildren, you know, <laughs> could you please tell me how to fix this or how to do this? Um, and it's that intergenerational listening and learning. And everywhere we go, we meet with young people. And at, at every, every opportunity, we want to have that. And that's why we're incredibly encouraged. And this is, I mean, the 20th of September, 2019, will be remembered as the day that somehow the world, the adult responsible world was called out by young people and told, you are not doing what you should be doing, you have to be more responsible.
I was going to wrap by asking all of you what gives you hope, but I think we just answered that. <laughs> so, so I want to end with a note from all of you to help all of us, which yeah. is after General Assembly Week comes and goes, after this current, you know, this, the Friday strikes, you know, getting a lot of attention right now, but the news cycle, it comes and goes in waves, right? So for the long haul, for all of us as individuals who might not have platforms, what is the best mindset for us to approach this? What frame of mind should we have when we look at climate change and when we look at environmental crisis? Mary. Well, I'm dying to tell you that. <laughs> 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 because I can, I can go back to my first time being at a social good conference. I was with Archbishop Tutu, who was then chair of the elders mm -hmm. that your grandfather called together. And uh, when he's in front of young people, of course, he loves them and he would think, and, um, the journalist who was moderating us wasn't as nice as you. In, in, she, was, <laughs> <laughs> she said actually quite sharply, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he said, oh no, dear, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. And that for me, a prisoner of hope, because hope means you find what's in the bottom of the glass. I mean, you must have had to dig very, very deeply. You find what you know, gives you the courage to go forward. You build. Um, I've, I've written a book of stories about climate justice, and the byline is hope, resilience, and the fight for a sustainable future. It's the hope. That's what we need, because we could talk about climate now, and I, I know there are a lot of young people who suffer climate anxiety. Get active. That'll help your anxiety. I know most of you here are probably quite active as it is, but the more you do yourself, um, make the difference, get others to make the difference, um, and be sort of in determined with courage to change things, that's the hope, and that's the best way forward. So look at it with hope. Salika? <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, yeah, hope. I, I actually wrote um, a book, uh, in I got published in 2013. I wrote an autobiography um, called When Hope Whispers. And that's really um, been um, an account of, um, you know, a lot of the social ills that um, plague many communities and all the issues that our youth go through. So I share a lot on, um, you know, overcoming um, addiction and overcoming alcoholism, depression, um, breast cancer, um, overcoming child loss, overcoming uh, sexual and physical abuse. And, I, and, and part of the reason why I wanted to do that was because there are so many people that have been rendered silent by um, mm. all these issues. And, and for me, I, I have to thank you know, my, my grandparents um, specifically um, for the platforms they've offered me to do what they've always taught me. And that is to remember that you know, in whatever challenges we have in life, no matter who you think you are in society or what it is that you've done, that you always have the power in you to make a difference in somebody mm. else's life. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Kakashan, I wake up two weeks from now. What should I be thinking? I think, firstly, we need to take concerted action in regards to all issues. You can talk about climate change, and I think in that, uh, in that aspect, we focus on communities that are the most vulnerable to these disasters. Secondly, I think it's time we elected uh, leaders and officials who have the vision and the intent to move away from fossil fuels, move away from uh, wasting resources on weapons of mass destruction, and instead invest in building a carbon neutral, healthy, happy future. As civil society, it's uh, the time for just talking and just shouting slogans is over. We need to start taking ground level actions on our own and start changing our own lifestyles as an individual. And then that will help us to help our communities and help our planet. And also and use your vote. Yes, absolutely, yeah. do use your vote. <laughs> I think as corporates, I think corporates need to stop their tokenistic uh, corporate social responsibility and actually start holding themselves accountable for their present and past actions that have contributed to environmental destruction. And just to summarize, I think it's very important that we stop being reactive and start being proactive. Yeah. And I would like to ask all of you in the audience and everywhere in the world actually to always ask yourselves, what have I done to help my community, to achieve equality, to help my planet? And your conscience will give you the answer and that will motivate you to step out of your comfort zone and make a positive difference. Mm, 
And the final thought, proactivity, Carrie. Well, it's hard to add to anything more after all this wisdom, but I would say a couple of things. Um, first of all, the difference between a victim and a hero is activism. So get out there and do something. That's number one. Now, quoting Mary Robinson, we have to, the first step to activism is actually taking action. So if, you, if there's one thing you want to do to really create change on climate change, become a vegetarian. So that would make a big difference to everybody become a vegetarian. Second, and this is also again quoting Mary, I hope you don't mind, but envision the future we're going to have, how great it's going to be mm. when, we, when we come to this future where climate change is no longer a problem. How the only way we're going to get there is by bringing communities together, mm. by getting racial equality, by working on women's rights. This is going to be so fantastic. So just keep in mind how great it's going to be. And then third thing I would say is um, vote. It's, it's better, it's better. <laughs> it's better to change your leader than your light bulb. <laughs> Don't forget that. And, and, then, <laughs> and then the fourth thing I would say is um, look around this room, look at all these people, go into your phone book, think about your Facebook friends and everybody you know and get them to vote for Democrat. You're in the United States. <laughs> the Republicans aren't going to help. Vote for Democrat. <laughs> Very friendly crowd. <laughs> I love the idea of approaching this with the mindset of optimism and how great it's going to be. And it has been absolutely great to share this afternoon conversation with you all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.